We're, we're here to talk tech, business, startups, all that good stuff. Let's talk about the challenges. Let's go right into it, right into the deep dive. Mm-hmm. What are key challenges you feel businesses face when scaling globally, my friend? I, I think uh, generally speaking, uh, not only when scaling, but the whole journey, it's all about learning. It's it's a, it's a more of a learning curve. And what I, what I learned is that that the longer you stay in the game, the more stuff you get to know and the more mistakes you do, of course, and the more th- good things that you do. So it's all about like just stay in the game as long as possible because the more trial and error, the more things that you learn and also try to surround yourself with people who actually have done it before and failed before. So this is something very, very important that I learned along the way is that I try always to get people who are totally different than me because at the beginning I did the mistake when I was like okay this guy we vibe we should work together that that was totally wrong no I shouldn't vibe with the guy who I need to work with actually if he have enough knowledge and expertise then it doesn't matter what is my my vibe with him it's all about like really how how he can help me uh, achieve what I want did he do this before did he have the the expertise that are required to do this and uh, what's also important about <clears throat> this part particularly is that I noticed that referrals uh, are having much higher chances of actually succeeding and achieving the goals that you want to achieve instead of just jumping off the blue and just hiring someone that you don't know. So when I started to leverage this network and trying to get people through people, then we started to actually see proper results. I love that you say that. And networking is so key, right? Yeah. I'm so into networking, like from Instagram to I don't even call it Twitter anymore from X to like YouTube to emails. It's everywhere now. You know what I mean? And if you're not wanting to put yourself out there in front of people in your community, let alone worldwide, I feel like a lot of folks, and I get in these conversations with them all the time, you're missing your calling, you're missing your blessing, and you got to just even just text, type, ask, go on Instagram, be like, hey, like, listen. Do you guys have any mentors out there that you can point me into the right direction? Right. And I'm like, for people that don't want to network, man, I don't know. It's weird to me. Seven years of doing this thing in podcasting, almost 500 episodes. I must be doing something well. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, mm-hmm. definitely, definitely. I, I totally agree about this. Just the thing I, I think about entrepreneurship is that it's very lonely road. And sometimes when you're just heavily involved in what you do, it just isolates you. So this is the price of the entrepreneurship journey and many entrepreneurs, including myself also, I have gone through this phase where I was like, no, I want to close the door on me. I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I want to hustle. I want to thrive and then I want to achieve. But then with time, then you start to like, okay, I need to actually get out and start seeing more people, hearing different opinions and so on. But also one of the key things in actually hearing other people's opinion is that is you need to be resilient in your mindset because not everybody is going to clap for you. A lot of people is going to actually give you a lot of criticism and not everybody is like being very nice. Some people say, that some people deliver their message in, a diff- in different ways, right? So you have to regulate your own emotions and mental health when you are receiving this feedback to be able to, you know, continue pushing and not be dismotivated somehow by, this, by these emotions. Yeah. I know before we hit the record button, we were talking about it briefly, but like, how do you yourself, Mohammed, really deep dive into yourself when you see like maybe negative remarks or comments and things like that, that happened, you know, in business or when people are criticizing you as a person and their businesses and the things that you've created, how do you turn that into a positive for yourself? It's actually a great question. And I can tell you, <laughs> I, I I remember I was following uh, one one man. I, I have a lot of respect. He was a doctor. And he was like talking about this. And he was saying like, when he started reading negative comments about him himself and what he does and everything, he started to imagine that the person who wrote this comment is a seven years old kid in his shorts somewhere in the middle of the forest that he does not know anything just have access to the internet and then he asked this question he said okay if this person would tell you this in front of your face would it have the same impact on you as it is it is online and then the answer was like no why because you would evaluate the person who's actually saying this because you can see him you can understand that he's just seven years old kid with just a short right so that actually made a lot of sense to me and since then, I'm like, okay, hmm, who's saying this? Let's see 
who is the background? What is the background of this person? Like, I, I try to find it, sometimes LinkedIn, sometimes Google, something. And then if I found that the person is actually, okay, he's coming from a great, great background, I, I should actually listen to this. Okay, what is this? But mostly the people who are actually with, 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 a, with a great experience and expertise, they are giving you constructive feedback. They don't involve any personal things. They just talk to you, okay, this product needs improvement in one, two, three, four. I love this. I welcome it. I can share it with my team. We all can grow from this. But other, otherwise, if it's unvaluable, then I try to just discard it. No, no, absolutely. And that's the thing. Mm. It, it, it happens to the best of us. Like, you don't <laughs> think celebrities or the movies we watch or the people that are of our influences, our mentors, our coaches don't go through it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm so big into social audio and social audio is so great right now. Um, you know, from like Clubhouse to Spotify Green Room. And there's a new one called Chatter that's out right now, created by uh, Nelson Apega from Million Marathon. Had his whole group, things like that. And I was listening to some of the big business owners in there, and they talk all about the same thing. And it's like, listen, you sometimes got to sacrifice a lot. And that's the thing what people don't realize. I'm pretty sure you can speak to it, I can speak to it. People don't know what it is. They think it's just easy to, to turn on a mic, create a podcast, get to 500 episodes create businesses, make money, do all of this stuff. But we have to go through sacrifices, loss of sleep, maybe missing functions, missing weddings, missing birthday parties. It's all happened. I've, I've done it. You know what I mean? People are like, Roy, I haven't seen you. Da, 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 da. I'm like, well, guys, this is what's happening. It's not personal that I can't be there. It's just at this time, this is where my focus has to be. And not many people can turn that lens on because they, they take offense to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And things like that. Yeah, I totally agree with you on this. And one of the exercises actually that I started doing, I started measuring how I feel and why I feel this and what happened before that and what am I doing when this happened. And when I started actually putting my kind of my life through this kind of system, I was able to come to, to, to visualize the patterns because most of the, okay, the most important thing I noticed in running the business is actually your your mental resilience because you're diving into the, the, the future, the unknown, like you're driving, like you think you're going to, okay, you're going to create something massive. So it's all, it's all right here. You don't have it right now, but it's all in here. And everything that happens around you really affects what goes in here. So when I, what I realized is that I'm trying to protect this with with everything I have, because once I protect this, this is my safe environment right now. I can think better. I can see the bright side. I, I, you know, I can see where we're going. I can even communicate better with my team, right? So I really realized that building great product is fantastic. Building great team is fantastic. But you as a founder, your mental health and emotional well-being, this is extremely important for everything else to function, everything around you. It just has to start from inside you. If you have that, you're able to, you know, master everything around you and the people and the team and investors and everybody. And then you're able to, you know, thrive and, and build more. No, no, absolutely. How did you build your business starting from, you know, the things you learned? Was it books? Was it family members? Was it mom, dad? Like, what, how did you get started into all of that? Uh, when I was like 16, I started when I was 16, when I came across Visual Studio 6 at that time. It was like kind of the primitive early days of of coding and i liked it a lot and i started building games out of that and i came up, i was also playing games in in the internet cafes you know back in the day like you have to go to a physical location to access the internet yeah <laughs> so i i used to go to this internet cafe and i was always playing games and one of my things that i wanted to solve is that w while i'm playing the the person had to actually call my name and say like hey your your time is over you have to finish and I was like, you know, just a kid. I don't have much, much, much income to my name. So I was like, okay, so I, I had to go. And then I was like, I came across the Visual Studio and I was like, okay, I got to do something. So I built a small clock that could be controlled from the main PC. So basically the, the, the main guy would set a timer for a specific user. And then when the time is over, then you get a very big yellow screen that tells you your time is up. You have to, to stop playing. So I built this software, very primitive, and then I started going to internet cafes door to door and saying, hey guys, I solved this problem. Would you like to take it? Would you like to buy it? And funny enough, most of them didn't pay for it. They just said, okay, we're going to give you some hours that you could play games in the internet cafes. And since then, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to play for free. And then with, with time, 
I, I started building, when I went to university, I was doing this, I built uh, the software for the university that you have like a database and you have all the students with all the comments and everything. And then going, moving forward, I actually built my first company. Uh, I was, I think, 24 years old. It was a um, selfie camera for the pocket. It was called Droofy. It was a hardware. So hardware is hard. I, I, I highly not advise people to go to hardware <laughs> if you want to build no, sure, sure. a business. It's very difficult. It, it's very difficult. And it's very expensive. So we learned that the hard way. But we learned a lot from it. And, and then we built uh, Zoo. From Zoo, we came across, we, we, we continued to build right, right now. I have three products in the market. But I think what's more interesting to the audience is how do you actually start? Because most of people don't have the, the means to actually start a business. So how do you start a business without the means? I think that would be more interesting to the, to the people who are listening. What I did, and I can share this with everybody, maybe someone will find it useful. I just asked myself, how much do I need? Only how much I need exactly to pay for my rent and pay for my food. Just necessities, no extras, just necessities. And I made this Excel sheet. I need this for the for the house, for the accommodation and so on. And then I said, okay, I need to find a job that takes at like maximum half of my time because I need the other half to work on my business, right? So half of my time and pays me only this amount so that I can survive. And I came across, uh, like we have a company in Europe called Bolt, which is like similar to Uber. So you're driving taxi, you're driving your own car, driving people. And I was like, okay, so how much can I make with that? So I made some calculations and I made, I took some people. And what I discovered is that the busy hours are, are literally from 7 in the morning till 10 in the morning. And that's it, it's dead. And then from 4 till 7 in the evening. So basically you're taking people to work and then breaking, taking people from work to home. And in the middle, I had my own time. I loved it. I literally loved it. And that's it. I signed up and I was working only three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening. And in between, I was working on my business. And I didn't spend any money building my business. Just for everybody who's listening here, that you, you think that you need money to build a business. I think you need money to grow the business. You don't need money to build the business. So what happened is that for the first three years, I did not take any salary from the company. And... The reason for that is that first, the company didn't have money. Second is that we're still building. So how it happened is that, especially in the software business, I'm talking particularly about software business, is building software is very achievable today. Like you can really get a person who know coding, who believes in your vision and in your product, and you guys could partner up. You could work on this part-time. There are even hackathons that you can build an MVP within 24 hours. So for people who are listening, MVP is like minimum viable product means that you build a very small functioning product of your idea. And then you can get funded from this from, from many accelerator programs or many, many governments. So what I, what I did is that I wanted to build Zoo initially. So I, I, I needed mobile developers. I need backend developers. Of course, and at that time, I did not, not even understand what is a backend. I had no technical like technical background to get to to through this. So what I did is that it's actually one of the ways that anybody could do today. So let's say, for example, you would like to start some kind of SaaS platform or tech platform. Make some research, try to understand what kind of programming language is suitable for this. At that time, when I did this, I came across something called Xamarin, which is a cross platform for uh, development of mobile apps. In order for me to get someone who's actually interested in this, I just created a Facebook group and I called it Xamarin and then the city name. So when someone is like interested in that and he will search, he will get the group and then they, they come inside. And believe it or not, that's exactly how I found my co-founder. So I created the group and then he joined because he's passionate about this Xamarin and he's a developer. So he joined it and we communicated, we went for a coffee and I said, Hey, listen, I'm, I'm trying to build this, 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 but we don't have any resources at the moment. And he agreed. And we had the, some sort of agreement at the time. And of course, like there are a lot of things that we could discuss about vesting and uh, a lot of things legally, but generally speaking, when you're trying to build a business, it's all about putting things together. You have to get people who are passionate about your idea and who have skin in the game. And you need to find some work that 
shouldn't take more than 50% of your energy. Otherwise, you will not be able to put any, any, any time in, in the business. And that's just how it started. And then from now on, we built the product, we validate it, and then we went to an accelerator program. They really enjoyed what we're doing. They invested in us. And then after the acceleration, then we started getting customers, and then we started growing, and then we got VCs. And it's just a very long road of six years, but just the principles are the same. If, if you know how to, to take it step by step, then you can achieve that everywhere, but not in any business. Some business are heavy in assets that they need upfront investment. And I, I, I think personally, it, it, it just puts a lot of pressure on the person because if you need to invest this money upfront, it's, it's very difficult, especially also when I also hear it a lot with the people I speak with, they say, okay, what about taking a loan to start my business? And I was like, this is the worst idea you could ever do because if, God forbid, something happens to the business, not only you have failed, but you have failed and you are in debt. It's like double trouble. So I, I don't think that people should do that. You should start the business without the money. You should validate the business without the money. And then once you have some traction, some customers that are actually paying for your product, there's a very small number of customers. This is enough reason for many, many, many institutions and people and angel investors to actually already invest in you. You you speak so clear and there's so much power and I can back up at half of the things that you said basically. Basically everything that you said because it's like you hear a lot of entrepreneurs that have been through it that have made, you know, millions and millions and whatever, thousands and they say the exact same thing. Don't take a loan. You know what I mean? But some people are like, oh, let me just take that loan. And okay, whatever happens, happens. And it's like, you know, the bank will come for you. There is taxes. There's a whole bunch of stuff that will come for you. But what I can speak to even more is finding that job that's going to pay you enough for you to maximize your best opportunity. Because none of us really want to work that nine to five, right? Do I still work a nine to five? I do. But there's ultimate sacrifices that I've done strategically to make me amplify this brand the way it needs to amplify. So I can make, I can meet, sorry, you know, great individuals like yourself and the laundry list of other people that I've had come on this network. And what that does is some people look at it and they're like, well, how's he doing it? It's because when you work from home now, I'll speak to people. I'm going to give people like the, the life hack. You get all your hours back. So... When I'm not in the lunchroom and I don't have to wake up and have to spend that extra time to travel, all my stuff I can focus on my email. Right? I don't have to worry about that commute. I don't got to worry about walking to work, driving to work. Because I can't drive and text. <laughs> I know some people, whoever doing that, like, you know, crazy. Can't do that. But now yeah. it allows me morning coffee or when I have my breaks to really establish and focus and hone on to what's that email that's coming through for that guest. Um, can I pitch to that guest? I have chances I can check my emails and check my DMs and stuff like that. And I can cultivate more relationships that way and still get my work done. So it's like, it's a win-win scenario and situation. You know what I mean? But I try to say this to so many people and they're like, <laughs> how do you do it? How do you do it? I see the podcast growing. I'm like, you see it, but you don't understand like the, the, the trials and tribulations I got to go through every single day. You know? Yeah, a lot of mm -hmm. details, man. A lot of details inside, and people just see the, the the tip of the iceberg. But a lot of work has been gone through it at the bottom too, and and also people are celebrating only their wins and sharing only their wins. That's also one of the things that uh, I you know I, I I realized is that when you go to LinkedIn or or Instagram or something, it's like oh my god, everybody's winning, and then you start to like recreate like oh my god, what about what am I doing? Everybody's winning. Everybody's like having margaritas and and beaches and and everybody in a, is in a good shape. Okay, and who who's fat then? If if everybody's in a good shape, <laughs> who's fat, guys? And then you're like, okay, so you realize it's, that, uh, yeah, it's so much because like just the other day there was a scenario and situation that happened. I was supposed to book time to go to a studio. I'm not gonna say too too much about the situation. Big miscommunication. But you know what I ended up getting? Me and my mm. guests connected even on a deeper level. You know what I mean? Mm. And what that's going to now amplify to be, that could be, that could be a long-term friend, network relationship. But I know that we're going to be so solid because there's so much that we understood. It's the powers that be sometimes, the laws of attraction, whatever people want to call it. 
So sometimes when you see turbulence happening, don't ever necessarily challenge it. Just be like, okay, embrace it, breathe in, breathe out and say, okay, you know what? That next day, it wasn't supposed to be for that specific time. And I can speak to that. That's the reason why this podcast now is all about overcoming adversity, helping, you know, any man, woman or child figure out ways to really dial into things. And I see it now, even with the younger generation, the younger generation is coming, ladies and gentlemen, Mm -hmm. they're looking at what we're doing and they're sifting through and they're like, okay, how can I go from point A to point B? What's the pinpoints he's not hitting at maybe the age of 30, 40, 50. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of crazy because I'm learning things from the younger generation now that I'm like, Mm -hmm. I didn't see that. I did not (laughs) see that. I didn't see that. But it's like, we're not ignorant to it. It's just, what happens? We're so enamored into our work, you know what I mean, and things like that. But we figure it out as we go, you know. Mm, yeah, yeah, for yeah. Sure. that's 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 true, man. It's it's very interesting what you said. Like you know, uh, when I'm also like um, trying to learn a lot of things, and um, actually I, I forgot what I'm about to say because like I I got so deep into thinking about what you said, and I was like, oh my god, I will remember about it, and I will get back to it a bit. A yeah, bit yeah, no, yeah. for sure. You know. It, it even brings the conversation to AI, right? Mm. And I just had a, I had a great conversation with a, a content creator who uses AI to mm. really enable her to work even better, right? Because right. it's like that tool. Mm. But so many human beings are scared of this thing. Mm. They're scared of AI because they think, <laughs> is AI going to like come out and a robot's going to knock on my door? There was a movie that came out. What was it called? Annabella. I don't know if you watched it. AI mm. robot that the girl built for her daughter. And it turned out to be a whole horror story. And I think wow. people see that. And they're like, <laughs> AI is going to be the horror story of our life. Actually, it's the most mm. resourceful tool. Speak to yeah. AI from your point of view and how yeah. does it really shape the business yeah. itself? Actually, it changed the, the business 180 degrees. I can tell you for a fact. I'll also take one example here. For example, in my in my own company in Zoo. So Zoo is actually servicing um, the food and beverage sectors to start accepting orders online. And also, if they have uh, like the drivers or kitchen or something, they have full system dispatchers and so on. One of the key challenges we had is actually customer education because. Mostly the people in the food and beverage, uh, they are experts in their industry. But when it comes to tech, it's it needs a little bit of you know, holding hand. And the, the, the onboarding curve was quite long. You know, we had to take a lot of like eight hours and days giving training and education and even telling them how to upload the menus. And they say, okay, we don't have pictures of, of this item. We don't have pictures of that item. And when, when AI came, I, it just transformed the whole business for us. Right now, we are generating the pictures of the food and items using using text. The second thing is that we're building their website using text. So what happened when the AI came, we, we saw this opportunity and I came up with a new product called Stunning. So anybody who's listening could use Stunning today. We have seven days free trial. So Stunning allows you to build any kind of website just by using words. You can just say, okay, I'm a dental clinic built for me a website for my, for my clinic. I'm based in this city and I would like to offer something or offer this service or something. Even without even writing so much details the ai will build the whole website including content and images and even the suggested pages for your clinic that was not possible before before the large language models that was not powerful possible before you you would have to hire a content creator and a, a marketing person to actually write you something then developer to build the website so the ai have transformed businesses 180 degrees literally now, now with AI, there are so many tools. Also, one of the platforms that I own is called What the AI. So, What the AI, the tech, it's like right now it have more than ten thousand AI tools. And when you go there, you can just chat with the chatbot and say, okay, I'm a marketeer or I'm I'm a developer, or whatever. Tell me, please, what tools I could use, and then it will scrap the ten thousand tools and tell you, okay, you could use this to do that, use this to do that, and so on, so on. So, the good thing about the AI is that. With the large language models, like, for example, coming from OpenAI or from Claude or from, from others, these are currently available as open source, not particular disease, but other ones that are similar, that are available right now as an open source. That's, that opens a whole new dimension for everybody to actually build on top of that. 
and you don't really need a lot of money anymore. I mean, like you don't have to pay for computing power anymore because you could still. All right. So like we were talking about uh, large language models is that today it's it's possible that you utilize AI as a developer in your pro in your product for a fraction of the cost, or even if you have existing business, you still can use the AI tools and integrate them inside your business. And you never know what the AI could do to your business unless you actually go there and check what tools are there. Like I can give you an example. We have a tool that we are using right now that it, it just plugs into our social media accounts, learns about our what we do and how we write things. And then immediately it's like she produces 30 days of content for social media, including images, text and everything. And I was like, wow. Do we still need someone to work on that now? <laughs> so you see, so with, with time, you start to utilize and optimize your business using technology, right? It might not 100% replace the people, but at least you can utilize people more efficiently, efficiently. So instead of them wasting more time on something particular, okay, so using AI tools, we could reduce the time we spend on this task from three hours to 30 minutes, then you already saved two and a half hours. Then you can just put the same resources in different, in different, in something else, right? Or if you feel like cutting the costs, that also useful because let's face it, this is the nature of the business. If you're a business owner, you have to continuously optimize your costs, and it, it's it's better to cut some expenses instead of just uh, making the the ship to think and everybody will die, right? So it's better just, you know, cut it on time. This I have seen this uh, with, with many, many, many founders and I, I also did this by myself, is that sometimes you you build a lot of um, relationships, which is great and I love it. But just the problem is that business is so dynamic. It's just so dynamic and it's like the, the small baby that needs to be fed. And if the market is telling you something, you need to take action on it. I understand that you still have liability towards everybody else and, and employees and partners, but at the same time, you have to also think about the business himself. So this is one of the things that I also struggled with a lot, you know. I know that businesses now seem to want to go automation, right? Mm. Form of AI, things like that. Mm. And I feel like more entrepreneurs because I think that's where the world's going right now. Is entrepreneurs are taking over. <laughs> Do you think businesses are going to adapt the model maybe down the road, maybe when AI is kind of, I'm not saying it's going to be obsolete, but AI is now in such a, it's, it's been embedded by entrepreneurs that now bigger businesses are going to be like, well, now they're using it. Let's use it now. And then they kind of miss their, they've kind of missed their opportunity. It's very interesting. I had actually this conversation with, with one of my existing investors. Uh, he's a tycoon in the telecom and it's like it's a 5 billion euro company. It's like huge. And I had exactly this conversation and I asked him like, are you guys using the AI now? And he said like, well, not really. We have just small parts that we could actually let the AI in. But other, other parts, bigger parts of the business, we really can't. So I really think, uh, as answering your question, I think it, it depends on the size of the business. But also don't forget the, um, the privacy uh, question here. Because in order for you to in embed the AI, you have to feed it with your information. And if you are relying on large language model from OpenAI, from other companies, they have access to your information. And m maybe for a smaller company, that, that might not be a huge risk, but for a bigger corporation, that's a, that's a risk. So either they would have to maybe take an existing model and then modify it and then put it in the house and then they start to make changes to it to be able to use it or they will risk the the fact that their information might be out there training other models on on it right so i really think also that the utility here because do you really need to put ai in everything that's the same question that we asked ourselves in 2018 when the blockchain was in the boom like do you need blockchain everywhere Right, because everybody was like, okay, when when the blockchain happens, every second startup was like, yeah, we use blockchain to to like, do you need it? 
Why blockchain? Why do you need it? So now with the AI, like every second startup you see, like talking, oh yeah, we use AI. Okay, why do you use AI? Are you solving a problem with AI? So for example, in our case, we, we with AI, we solved the onboarding. It's just immediately we created the pictures, the menus, the, the website, everything was done using words. Wow, that's a utility, right? It just was, instead of uh, onboarding 10 customers, you're able to onboard 100 now. That That's a utility, right? But if the business does not need the, the AI, then what is the point of trying to, to put it? Because not every business needs the AI, right? You, you get, you get my, my, my point? So no, I do. I, I do get your point. That. I get your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's the thing, like, if you're a content creator, especially with what I have to use it for, I won't lie. There's parts of AI I use to limit the productivity. So I'm not manually putting, like, the captions on the videos. Like, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you this. It's AI. I don't have the time to type it all out. I'm pretty sure you use cash for your AI. We're, we're not doing that, right? Well, so, well, of course, of course. That's a tool. That's an yeah. excessive tool for creators, podcasters, you know, people that are getting in speaking engagements that they use. And now it's like, it's even on your phone. You can even get mm. apps downloaded. I'll give people a, a, a free gem here. Captions on iOS. Like, it's mm. what, $13 a month, I think 80 a year. Get that. Use that. If you're in your speaking gigs, that's that's free. Utilize information for your fingertips and things like that. And I think that where I believe AI is going to even take a step is what it's going to do. And you see it with our social media apps. You see it with Instagram. Now they have an AI generator thing. Yeah. What's going to happen with our phones? <laughs> I know by the time this comes out, we're going to be probably about two or three months away from the new iPhone. We're hearing some mumblings. They're going to do AI in the iPhones. People are like, yo, what does this mean? Is this game over? <laughs> you be able to record the conversations. There's no more he said, she said. Nah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's going to get dangerous. And some people are going to be like, well, I don't know if I'm going to have conversations anymore. Are we just going to just do FaceTime only? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but where do you think, like, especially with mobile mm. and AI, like, mm. How do you feel like it's going to be even be more of an advantage for us as creators and business owners? Yeah, I think I I love it very much actually that you said that. And also I watched uh, some um, some report, and also I know one founder. What they are did what they have did with image recognition and AI is that, for example, in the retail industry, when you used to go to search, for example, for a black dress, for example, then the the, the typical search would find the, the the dress dress that is that is tagged black dress. But with AI, it could actually get you a gothic dress or maybe um, a dress that is more darker or something. What I want to say is that using AI, you're able to translate emotions into words that you're able to pull from database. So people don't need to know anymore exactly what they want to search for it. They could just give the, the general idea and AI would just understand it and then come up with the things that are more relevant and then show it to, to, the, to the people. And I have seen this a lot. And about the mobile, I think the, the use case in the mobile here will be, for example, in the pictures. So when you implement the AI in the phone, for example, if you have a lot of pictures that you take that contains uh, happy moments, then you're able actually to, to type text. Okay, can you show me the pictures where I'm most happy? Then the AI will tell you, okay, you have been happy in this location, in this location, in this location, on this date, and this memory, and so on. So this is something very useful for, for, for the well-being, for the person to have it like that, right? Uh, the second thing with the AI is that, for example, your notes, you're writing your notes and you'll ask AI, okay, can you summarize for me all my notes or what I have writing here? What should I do on Thursday? Like, oh, you have, you have this appointment, you have that, uh, that thing to do, you have to go to the gym and all of these things. And also about the calls that uh, it's very, very funny. You mentioned that about that you're very free to have calls with people anymore because like it's, you said, he said, well, this is going to happen. I'm, I, I'm hoping that people, when they record the call, it's like with the consent. But generally speaking, if you have the summary of the conversation, and we still use it until today, by the way, in the business, is that you, the AI will break down for you all the, the summaries. So you agreed, yeah, action points. We will buy groceries. We will take the kids. We will go to the game. So these are action points that actually the AI came take out from the conversation that you guys had. So you don't have any more to take notes and things like that. So I really think that AI is magical in every way. 
Like right now we take these things for like, no, see me granted, but I mean, it is magical. When you think about it, it's like, wow, this is insane. You know, like, and the AI is, is like, you, you can't unsee it anymore because once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Like right now you cannot live the life as it was before the AI, because right now you say, okay, I, I have some, some words in my idea, some, some words I have, I'm going to put it in chat GPT and it's going to put it together in a proper format. And that's exactly what happens. So I want to write an email. I'm so emotional. And then I write it and, and I say for chat GPT, please make it nice. <laughs> you know, please make it professional. And then the email is written, well written. I would have never written it that way. Right. <laughs> so, and even Donald Trump, actually, we, we have the election happening and, um, Donald Trump said exactly the same thing. He said that he put his his speech into ChatGPT, and he was fascinated by the results that came up came out. And they had to refix his speech based on the AI. So that's something was just said uh, recently, and I was like, "Wow, that's uh, he's endorsing the AI now." So it's 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 getting scary because I know, and I'm not going to say any names. Mm. But in the sports online community for gambling, mm. guys are using parts of AI to generate the best lineups depending on what they're picking. And mm. believe it or not, it's going to sound really, really interesting on this. Mm. Some of those are hitting. So you can mm. actually cash out if you know what you're doing. And it's like, I was joking with one of my guys. It's like fantasy football, NFL season's right around the corner. Mm. I'm like, man, maybe I said nobody's using auto draft because... I don't trust the AI for guys going <laughs> to simply sit here, mm. auto draft their thing, set up their lineup to what it needs to be. And they start picking all this stuff based off of AI because AI can just simply say, is, OK, this person is going to be hot this season. That person is going to be hot this season. And the next thing you know, you're watching auto draft. And you're like, wait, why did he take that guy? You know, if he was here, you would have never drafted that person. Oh, AI is telling you what to do. So you just mm. import it into your little computer and then, hey, voila, you know. So I think. What, what we're trying to say here with folks is if you're in a business, entrepreneurship, or even if you're using it for smaller tasks, don't run away from it. Really use the resources. There's, there's an essential pieces of communication online through YouTube, through podcasts. Really watch those to learn. Not the clickbait stuff of like mm -hmm. how AI is going to make you raise a million dollars tomorrow. No, but like there's, there's the good stuff out there, the, the, the useful information and things like that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. There are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people are scared from this because they they are not yet fully well. You don't understand. You don't need to really understand AI, but you just need to you know how to use the AI. Just how you can utilize it to your to your needs. And there are a lot of uh, tools out there that are very simple and very easy for the people, and also very affordable. By the way, a lot of tools that we list on the website is like starting at like I don't know seven bucks a month and up to fifteen bucks a month. So it is, in, in my opinion, seven dollars or, or ten dollars is affordable for for people to 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 use it. You know, price of a cup of coffee, Starbucks. If you go to Starbucks yeah. or wherever yeah. you drink yeah. your coffee from, you know, and yeah. things like yeah. that. Instead of spending all that you know, mindless money on things that don't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Put it into things that are going to actually up your game. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm always about continuous learning audible mm -hmm. to, you know, audio books and things like that. Like that paying that $15 a month, ladies and gentlemen is mm -hmm. game changing. You know, yeah. I see friends that are, they say they spin the block back around and they're listening to other audio books and stuff like that. My hack for audio books right now is uh 1.5 in speed. It actually mm. forces you to listen to what's going on. Mm. You know what I mean? So yeah. more of useful information for the for the audience here and things like that. For mm. you, Mohammed, though, mm. before we get out of here, what's next for you? And like, how are you looking to really? Because I at, we're recording this, we're mid July. Like, when we blink, it's fourth quarter. You know what I mean? It's going to the end of the year. How are you wanting to really maximize the end of the year for yourself? That's a great question, man. I'm glad that you said that. Oh, so I have, I, I have a plan for this year, and hopefully, like um, I'm gonna achieve it. One of the main important things that I learned in business is retention, because before that I was like about yeah, customer acquisition. Let's let's get new customers and all these things. It, this is cool, but what is even more cool is actually retaining your existing customers. When a person comes to try your product and they just don't convert, you gotta know why. Because he came initially interested in your product and he was ready to, to use it. 
There are a small fraction of people who are just, you know, trying for, for, for without any intention, but majority of people have intention to try your product because they think it's going to be, benefit them in some way. So what we're trying to do now internally with all my teams, and also we had we invited one more member who is expert in this field, is that we're trying to optimize our conversion internally. The person who signed up for the free trial, I'm trying to serve him as much as possible so I can convert him into a customer, and then I'll, I want him to stay with me as long as he as possible as long as possible to happen so my plan right now that we're working on right now is that we stopped investing in marketing because we're having a lot of inbound already coming and also we do the outbound with email outreach and right now we're just monitoring and trying to analyze how people are using the product what steps they take and how we can improve it and by doing so we are able already to capture bigger portion of your existing customers because many businesses including me i was focusing as well on customer acquisition getting new customers getting new customers all the time but then you just realize like it's it, it just not easy to scale like this it takes longer to scale like this while if you already retain your existing customers and then Whenever someone comes new, you learn from their journey, why they left you and why they bought from you. Then with every other customer that comes, you have a very high chances of conversion and retaining this customer and increasing your revenue without, of course, burning cash on customer acquisition. Because acquiring customer today is getting more expensive because you're not alone in the market. So every minute there's a new business opens, there's no new SaaS tool opens. With the AI, with, with the large language models, you can build an app in two days just as a front end and then you have the APIs, you connect with large language model and then you build an app to make pictures. Woohoo! In two days, literally. So, and you, you have also stable diffusion, mid journey and, and so, so many things. So you have to first build a utility but then make sure that you retain the customer this is very very important lesson that took us long time to to came to because it was always like yeah we have to spend money on advertising so we can get more customers no that's okay that's good but this is a small thing but you already have if if 10 people came to your product they tried it and only five bought you need to learn you need to understand why the other five did not buy you need to know this in order for you to stay in business and you, you still to grow. And you will be surprised uh, uh, by the reasons because we assume a lot as an entrepreneurs. And when we started measuring things, we were like, oh my God, how did we miss that? How did we miss that? I will give you a very simple example that we discovered recently is that in our tool, we allowed people to build websites using chat. We realized after an analysis that more than 60% of the people, when they get to the chat stage, they don't know what to do. And we were like, why? We thought it's like very simple. Just type, hi, I want to build a website. But it didn't happen. So what we did is that we removed this and we built a wizard that asks them question, what is your website is about? And then next, what are the colors? And then next. And guess what? The conversion skyrocketed. It, this was like something for us as an eye-opener, as a developer, this was like, we thought having a chat, everybody knows how to chat, right? No, no, not everybody, no. <laughs> so don't jump to assumptions, just try to measure the metrics, try to, to and, and trust me, it, it can be the simplest things that would make all the difference in the world. It could be as simple as when people are checking your, your, your platform from, from their phone, the button or the call to action is not visible. And that drops 70% of, you, of your users. That alone is enough reason for you to <laughs> you know, not, not, not convert your customers. So you're, 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 you're speaking some real truth here because you see it with a lot of the big business conglomerates. I'm not going to call out any of their names, but you look from the stock market to their business practices, to the competition. And I've always said it just seems like it's a form of ignorance to where you see big corporations never, ever really want to adjust the main issue. But entrepreneurs are the ones that are always at the forefront to always want to amplify and say, okay, well, listen, if five people did this, why did the other 10 not do that? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's why I've always said is entrepreneurship, nobody really wants to be in the nine to five bustle anymore. That's the reason why people are going entrepreneurship. But hey, 
Let somebody else tell it. They'll be like, oh, you know, that's just a risk. Well, mm. with risk comes reward. You know what I mean? Yep. 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 Yeah. That's true. For sure. Muhammad, I appreciate you. I appreciate everything you stand for. Uh, mm. This is the opportunity here. I would like you to plug all your information where everybody can check you out, right? Mm. Your website, Instagram, all that good stuff, my friend. Sure. So my personal website is MohammedGaze.com. I'm also the founder of Stunning.so, which allows you to build websites using words. Also, I founded WhatTheAI.tech, one word, and it has 10,000 plus AI tools. It's uh, for free for everybody. Please uh, check it out. And uh, the last uh, platform I have, it's mostly for the food and beverage industry. It's called Zio.eu. So anybody who have any questions, guys, feel free to reach out to me. I'm also on Instagram. I also create content about the AI. My Instagram is bored, like bored, mo, M-O-H. So one word, bored, mo, I think you can, you can link it in. Bored, mo, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you, my man. We'll definitely Thank do you. this down the road again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Take care. Okay.